Welcome to another episode of Greetings and Salutations. This is Wayne O'Connor from WayneO'Connor.com. May Jesus Christ richly bless you and keep you. You who are, you are your father's son. You are your father's son in each and every way. You are his eternal paragon each and every day. All honor and glory to you. O oh, Jesus, Yahweh, Son, yes, Jesus, you are, you are, you are, you are, your Father, Son. Hello, folks. This is Wayne O'Connor from WayneO'Connor.com, and this is the Greetings and Salutations radio show. I made a copy of uh, this show last week, but the sound was so distorted that I have to do it again. And so instead of being whatever day it was... It is February 17th, 2018. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings, protections, and provisions during the coming week. I pray, Jesus, that you dispatch your angels to prepare people to hear this message and to have mercy on them and soften their hearts so that they may accept it and make their relationship with you stronger. God occasionally asked his prophets to paint strange word pictures I feel he has done the same with me, but I am glad he did not ask me to do that in ways of other servants listed in the Bible. I am glad, for example, that Jesus has not asked me to walk naked and barefoot in front of people, Christian or not, as a sign. Believe me, that would be a horrible sight. We read in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3, quote, and the Lord said, Like is my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. End quote. So for those of us who are prudish or easily embarrassed, they may decide that this verse is not in my Bible. It is there in many translations, not just the King James. Just like the sun is yellow, would I see it in the sky? It is yellow. Another brother or sister may stand outside on a sunny day, stamp their foot, and shout, No! It is purple! It's up to you. I'm not going to lord it over you and demand that you say the sun is yellow. If you want to say it's purple or even chartreuse, go for it. I can't find this story, but I once read many years ago about an incident with a young lady. She may have been a Quaker, but... I think she gave the same performance in at least three or four different churches in nearby communities. I believe the alleged event had occurred in the 18th century. I think it happened in colonial America. According to the story, a young woman walked into a Quaker meeting naked, carrying two wine bottles, which she smashed together and said, in essence, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord is going to do the same to you if you don't repent. Your hearts are cold and you are naked and blind and won't admit it. She then exited the church. I think about a year later that many members of that church and the other churches where she enacted prophecy died in a disaster, plague, or native uprising. I can't remember the specifics. We read of another incident in Ezekiel. I am also glad Jesus has not called me to do this. Ezekiel 4. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity." For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year." 
Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another, till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Take thou also unto thee wheat, and barley, and beans, and lentils, and millet, and fitches, and put them in one vessel, and make thee bread thereof, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side, three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by way twenty shekels a day, from time to time thou shalt eat it. Thou shalt drink also water by measure the sixth part of a hen, from time to time shalt thou drink. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came their abominable flesh into my mouth. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment, that they may want bread and water, and be astonished one with another, and consume a way for their iniquity. End of the quote from Ezekiel 4. It may have been much simpler for God to have had the prophets say, Repent, or I will bring famine and war against you. Instead, he called his prophet to act out the prophecy. Hebrews 11.19 concerns a much more widely known acting out of prophecy. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on the land where Jesus would one day be crucified for our sins. According to the author of Hebrews, probably Paul the Apostle, Abraham knew that even if he did sacrifice his son, that God would resurrect him. If you remember the story from Genesis 22, an angel appeared and stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son. A ram was then provided to Abraham, which he sacrificed instead. I don't know about you, but I do not have any children, and I don't even want to think about the possibility of God asking me such a thing. But it is there in the scripture. God is sovereign, and it ended up being a safety net obedience test. I talk about safety net obedience tests in my book Kingdom Lessons 1, which is available at Amazon.com. In Matthew 23, 37, we read about Jesus saying that he wished to gather... In Matthew 23, 37, we read about Jesus saying that he wished to gather the Hebrews to him, like a mother chick wants to gather her hens to protect and care for them. Uh, Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not. For many of us, Jesus wants to do the same. He wants to have a relationship with us. I'm not talking about Satanists here. I'm not talking about pagans here. I'm not talking about atheists here. I am talking about followers of Jesus Christ who gather together weekly and partake in a form of religion and participate in a Jesus social club, but do not want a relationship with Jesus. Maybe Christians naturally go through a stage of this, but they have to mature past that stage. Jesus loves us and has great mercy on us. However, if we don't eventually give in, either we will suffer hardship or, to our shock and dismay, we find that we, quote, never knew him, end quote. The last pastor of my first church sighed deeply when I asked him about this verse. I had this conversation with him not long after I had returned from college. The pastor had said, 
Wayne, I'll be honest with you. I don't really understand this verse, and to be frank, it scares me. Not long after that, Jesus took me away from the church of my childhood and moved me on. And Matthew seven twenty one through 23, that's the verse we were uh, talking about, says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. All this to say, one of the main areas of an active prophecy for me has to do with something called the Friendship Tower. I am not going into detail now, but I talk about the Friendship Tower Chronicles in many of the Kingdom Lessons books. When Jesus teaches me a concept, it seems like it is not enough for me to understand an issue intellectually. He wants me to feel the issue deeply and understand his heart. In a vision in 1989, Jesus said that he was going to use the Friendship Tower to bring me greater unconditional love, obedience, and discipline. And he has used it for decades to give me greater strength in these areas. Jesus also said that going through this series of events would also give me a prophetic understanding of many things happening today in the American church, whether they meet in buildings or in homes. One of the things Jesus wanted me to know is just how many people who call themselves by his name really don't have a relationship with him. They enjoy clubbing or at least put up with their local Jesus gathering in a religious environment, but when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road, they pretty much do what is right in their very own eyes. They learn the buzzwords, and many put on such a good show that unless you have discernment or spend time around them during the week, when they are not wearing their Sunday go meeting costume, you have no idea that they are just going through the motions. Over and over, Jesus asks them to have a relationship with him or perform a task for him, but they, like the vineyard owner's son, who said he would, but didn't, just go on parading the dog and doing what is right in their very own eyes. See Matthew chapter 28, verses 21 through 32. The son who said he would not actually went later and worked in the vineyard. Jesus may even continue for a season to bless them financially and protect them from demonical attacks. But that season eventually comes to an end. Either the hand of blessing and protection is withdrawn, and they come to Jesus for help, or they soldier on and play the religious game, and finally enter into a Christless eternity because they did not truly repent of their sin. Now, of course... When the Lord withdraws his hand, his ear will be listening. And if you cry out and you repent and you're sincere, he will be there and he will help you and he will start arranging circumstances. But you need to cry out to him if you come to that point. So many of us, and I've been there and done that and bought a closet full of souvenir t-shirts. I have played this game in my past. Often for years, Jesus wants a relationship. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Instead, we may either ignore him or just say yes with our lips, but with our hearts far from him. We settle for using the right buzzwords and faithfully attending our social club and continue to push Jesus away. We might be saying, I love you, Lord. But by our actions, we are saying, I love you, Jesus, chuckle, but not that much. If you haven't already done so, listen to my radio show, I love you, Jesus, chuckle, but not that much. 
Do you really care about Jesus? Do you really love him? Are you going to continue to push him away and do what is right in your own eyes and just go through the motions without totally committing your heart? Once again, I'm not talking Satanists, pagans, and atheists here. I am talking about people who call themselves by Jesus' name and have joined themselves to a group of people who know the right buzzwords and meet together. This is something each of you has to work through with Jesus yourself. You're not going to come to Jesus on your pastor's apron strings. You're not going to come to Jesus on your mother's apron strings or your father's apron strings or your husband's apron strings or your wife's apron strings or your boyfriend's apron strings or your girlfriend's apron strings. They may be used to bring you closer to Jesus. But ultimately, you're the one who has to decide whether you're going to give in and allow him to bring you to the point where you have a relationship and become more and more like him. Do you really care about Jesus? Do you really love him? Or are you going to continue to push him away and do what is right in your very own eyes and just go through the motions without Committing your heart. Once again, I am not talking Satanists, pagans, and atheists here. I am talking about people who call themselves by the name of Jesus and have joined themselves to a group of followers who gather in his name. It's great that you gather in his name, but you need to know him. You need to seek a relationship with him. And like I said, this is something that each of you has to work through with Jesus yourself. Do you want him to know that you are serious about giving him obedience, priority, and devotion? Do you want to pretend that he is your Lord? Do you want to push him away and hold him at a distance? If you do this, are you expecting him to love, cherish, and provide for you and protect you? Jesus is very patient. He is also sympathetic and kind. However, there is a season, but only a season, where he will put up with this pushing away behavior. Eventually, one of three things has to happen. One, his hand of mercy withdraws. Two, one day you make it into his heavenly kingdom as if going through fire. See 1 Corinthians 3.15. Or three, you find you are one who joined a Hail Jesus Victory Club, but never truly repented. And to your surprise, in the end, you find that you are dead. Your sins have not been forgiven and you are not in heaven. Fleeces are another issue that may fit into this discussion. Once I found out that I had the ability to ask Jesus for fleeces as a toddler in Jesus, he would answer them for me quite often. Once I started to mature, he began to want me to hear him more clearly, more often than relying on fleeces. You will find examples of fleecing in Judges chapter 6 and Acts chapter 1. And no, I'm not talking about fleecing the flock. That's a whole different concept. So no matter how old you are physically, if you are young and walking in a relationship with Jesus, fleeces are an acceptable manner of asking of God. But Jesus will want you to develop a sensitivity to his spirit over time and rely on that rather than Fleeces. Another related issue is that many Christians believe they have a strong relationship with Jesus, but they have not spent much time reading the Word, praying, or hearing from God. They may sit in their pews every Sunday and give financially and give generously, or even have a leadership position or a ministry title, yet they do not have a strong sense of the Holy Spirit and hearing the Holy Spirit. The other side of the coin concerning fleeces is that many people will ask Jesus in prayer about an issue and then ask for 50 confirmations. After they start to get the first 49 confirmations, they just play dumb as each new one comes along and do whatever is right in their very own eyes. Asking for a few confirmations is fine, but asking for a large number or ignoring them is really a sign of immaturity, or one who is a seeker but has found only knowledge about Jesus. 
he or she has not truly repented and does not know Jesus in the sense of the original word. The original sense of the word is like a relationship between a man and his wife. It is not superficial knowing about something. It is a strong and deep relationship. One of my first mentors had a saying, if your prayers aren't answered and you keep running into obstacles, go back to the last time God asked you to do something or you promised him to do something. Repent and do it and things will get better fast. This also reminds me of a common Facebook meme that I see on Facebook often. A lady prays to God to find her a good husband. Quote, someone who understands me, loves me deeply, and makes me feel special, end quote. Later she cries out, quote, God, why didn't you ever answer my prayer for a husband, end quote. God replies, quote, I answered your prayer. You just keep saying... I don't want a relationship with him or to marry him. I just want him as a friend! Exclamation point. End quote. While not being part of the meme, it is just as possible for such a lady to simply say he's not good enough, or she can say, I have this dream to serve you, Lord, in a special way, and a husband does not fit that plan. I have met many Christians who start their day with, quote, this is what I'm going to do for you today, Jesus. Bless me and make it all work out perfectly. Granted, this is better than not honoring Jesus at all. One of my first mentors was often wont to say, though, if something good keeps you from something better, it is bad. So in that sense, the bless me, Jesus, this is what I'm going to do for you today, Christian syndrome, is bad. They are probably nice and caring people. But the best way is to ask Jesus to help you accomplish what he wants for you today. It is not the easiest way, but it is the best way. And it's not a quick way. It's not the fast food Christianity that we want. And God will tend to work that way a little bit with baby Christians. But as you grow up, you can't expect fast food from God. You have to wait for it. I am reminded of the testimony of a retired evangelist. He has probably gone to be with Jesus by now. Just before the man was about to graduate from high school, a speaker came to his church and gave a sermon on how God wanted more American missionaries to go to South America and Africa. Anyway, using motivational techniques, the man convinced the youth that he was supposed to be a missionary to Africa or South America. And that man, after a lot of struggle, went through Bible school and he found a denomination, I think it was Lutheran, not to pick on the Lutherans, and he went to, I believe it was South America, for 30 years. And after 30 years, that young man was old. He had accomplished very little in that country for ministry, and he returned home depressed. He quietly shared with the Lord how he felt and asked Jesus if he had wasted 30 years of his life. That week, he visited three churches in a short period of time after he had returned from South America to live in the United States and to retire. And he had received three words all saying the same thing, but they were worded a little bit differently, of course, in each church. But basically, the word was, quote, and this is a paraphrase, of course, but I'm saying, quote, I called you to be a teacher here in this country, not a foreign country. If you will grow close to me and let me teach you my ways, I will use you in this country, and your ministry will bear more fruit the first year than the 30 years you spent in a faraway land where I did not call you to go, and paraphrase. This is not a quote, like I said, but rather a paraphrase. That means it's basically you get the gist of what he was told, but I don't know what he was told exactly for a word in all three of those churches, but it was pretty close to what the message was that I shared here. Many Christians have goals to serve Jesus, 
but have not asked him to show them what he wants for them. Or they ask him, and then they just do whatever's right in their own eyes instead of waiting on him. And that may take a few months or maybe even several months for Jesus to confirm it in a way where they know that he's talking to them. They just have this dream, which on the surface seems noble, but they won't surrender those dreams to him. They just keep saying in their own way, this is my dream and I am sticking to it. What you are asking me to do, Jesus, doesn't fit. Are you going to answer my prayers or not, Jesus? Are you going to bless me or not, Jesus? We're not talking Satanists, pagans, or atheists here. We are talking about people who say they belong to Jesus and gather in his name on a weekly basis. I once talked to a lady who felt she was a great woman of God. When she read my book, The Coming Judgment of America, she took great umbrage. She became deeply angry about it, and she snapped to me, quote, or this is actually probably just a close paraphrase, but it was pretty close to this. My Jesus is not a spouse abuser. If Jesus lets me or my family or my country suffer in that judgment, he is a spouse abuser, end quote. I asked her, were the twelve apostles who were tortured, imprisoned, or executed in his service abused by Jesus? She snapped, well, that's different. My Jesus is not a spouse abuser. Maybe that is a problem for some of you. I am not talking about Satanists, pagans, and atheists here. I am talking about people who are called by Jesus' name and are little followers of Christ. Are you serving the real Jesus or a storybook Jesus of your own or a religious man or woman's creation that blesses, protects, and provides for you no matter what? A God with a small g that forgives everyone but does not bring discipline into your life and allows you to do whatever is right in your very own eyes. There is a Jesus who is real and died for your sins, who is the Son of the Most High God, while the real Jesus is kind and patient. To continue under his protection, blessing, and provision, he must be Savior and Lord. As little Christ, that is your choice to make. I can't make it for you. It would be remiss of me not to share the following. We must always recognize the sovereignty of Jesus. If it is time to go home with him, it is time. If we have to suffer for his sake, we must be willing to do so. Paul and Silas were beaten and imprisoned, and they sang hymns. That's in Acts chapter 16. Read it. It is there. So many of us are quick to shout, Heresy! That's not in my Bible! If that was your first response, you need to read your Bible and familiarize yourself with it. You also need to be willing Bereans and check your Bible before fighting the gold or telling people that they're heretics. With some of us, we are only willing to be obedient if we get what we want when we want it. If we aren't rewarded for our obedience with instant gratification, we may grumble but keep putting on the show. But Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus is not a lamp genie. He answers prayer, but he is not our every wish fulfillment agent. Sometimes he says no, not now. Or if we get cranky, he may give us our giant white elephant in our tiny living room. If we find ourselves in that situation where we want what we want and we want it now, we really need to seek Jesus. See my article, Flowers from Jesus, available at my blog, wayneoconnor.com, or in Kingdom Lessons 3. We need to find out if we are merely being tested, we are baby Christians with wrinkles and rolls and gray hair, or if we have joined ourselves to a local body of some religious institution, either steeple building or a living room, but have not truly repented, we need to seek Jesus and get that straightened out. If we have not truly repented and accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, we may come before Jesus one day only to hear him say, Go away, I never knew you. It is written, Today is the day of salvation. In like manner, any day is a great day to sincerely say, Jesus, I want to be more like you. 
I want to have a relationship with you. I want to make you happy. I want to give you my devotion. I want to make you and your kingdom my top priority. Another article or radio show that would be good for you to listen to is entitled Saving Faith, or What is Saving Faith? And basically, what it seems the Lord has shown me is that there's a real fine line when it comes to evangelism. There are certain evangelists who are in error when they teach you all you've got to do is say a magic word, or they'll recite the sinner's prayer and have you repeat it. If you check carefully and look at all the scriptures, it's a little bit more complex than that. On the other side of the coin, you've got you know people who will put all these extra laws and stipulations on being saved that's not really there. God has to call you, basically. You have to realize that you need to be saved, and you need to uh, repent, and you have to have faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But, that said, we can't say Jesus plus anything. Even though the Lord showed me that maturation is very important, that's something I think he's saying is independent of asking him for salvation. But it's like my grandmother had this saying, the proof is in the pudding. If you sincerely repented when God called, you're going to have your baby stage, but you will mature through it and you will develop that relationship with him. But there are many people who just say the magic words when it's not in their heart, and then they're going to end up being surprised because they either make it to him as if through fire, like Paul talked about in Corinthians, or when they die, they're surprised and shocked because they didn't make it to heaven. But anyway, I talk about this in more detail in What is Saving Faith, which is, I believe, in Kingdom Lessons 2 and also in my radio show list. It's a good teaching. I realize that this has not been an easy teaching. But I believe it is important, and I thank Jesus for sharing it, and I thank all of you who openly listen and share it with others. May Jesus richly bless you and keep you in 2018 and all the days of your life. Thank you again. This is Wayne O'Connor from Greetings and Salutations Radio Show. You who are, you are your father's son, you are your father's son. In each and every way, you are his eternal paragon, each and every day. All honor and glory to you, O Jesus, Yahweh, Son. Yes, Jesus, you are, you are, you are, you are your Father, Son. Anyway, this is Wayne O'Connor from wayneoconnor.com blog, wishing you a good day or a great evening, whatever the case may be. Thank you for listening. See you next time on Greetings and Salutations Radio Show. And visit me at wayneoconnor.com.